tonight on Unidentified. They all changed position, and then they were gone. And as soon as I turned the lights, like, the, she was <laughs> straight to me. When you look at the data, the Nimitz was not an isolated event. I know what I saw. Even if I don't know what it is, I know I saw it. Do you know what it's like to serve your country only to have someone come out and say, you're crazy? The Pentagon has confirmed the existence of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program that studied UFOs, and they released video. There's a whole fleet of them. My gosh. For eight years, Lou Elizondo ran a secret UFO program for the US military. But in 2017, he quit in protest. I put my entire future on the line because I believe in what I believe in. Now he's joined an elite group of former government insiders. Their mission, reveal what they say is the truth about UFOs. US airspace is being violated by vehicles of unknown origin with advanced capabilities. This is real, and we're going to get to the bottom of it. I I've seen too much. I've talked to too many people. I can't in good conscience just keep my head buried in the sand. So while investigating the Nimitz incident, we came across some information that leads us to believe that there may be a particular area, rally point, so to speak, where some of these things are going. That's a big deal. At a minimum, we need to get down to that site, and we need to figure out what's going on. Lou Elizondo is following an extraordinary break in his investigation into a major military UFO sighting off the West Coast. In the fall of 2004, two F-18 pilots from the USS Nimitz told Elizondo they came face to face with a bizarre tic-tac-shaped object. High G, rapid velocity, rapid acceleration. No, whoa, we don't have that. You know, and I'm talking, we're flying one of the premier airplanes on the planet. But the incident wasn't an isolated event. A Navy technician revealed the craft allegedly traveled underwater at nearly two times the speed of the fastest US submarine. According to one of the sonar guys, they were going 70 plus knots under the water. And another Navy radar specialist says he had tracked as many as 100 of the strange craft for days. They fell off my radar envelope down off the coast of um, Baja, California. OK. These things were going somewhere. I could tell you the Latin long. We now have a very good lead on a potential hotspot. What does that mean? I don't know what does it mean. Are these things, can you see them all the time flying around out there? Is it underwater? What about the locals? These are all other things now that we can use to help us start collecting additional data points and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Hey, how are you, brother? I'm good, how are you doing? Good, man, I'm pulling right up. Joining Elizondo is a new member of the investigation who himself was a witness to the strange events of November 2004. Different people have different motivations for, for coming forward. I mean, these are soldiers or sailors who've been involved in something extraordinary. They're not quite sure what to make of it, but they want the truth to come out. How are you, my friend? Very good. How are things going? They're outstanding today. Sean Cahill served 20 years in the Navy. He was the top security officer on the USS Princeton, a missile cruiser in the USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group. Cahill was responsible for law and order aboard the ship and running counterterrorism patrols at sea. Tell me when this event began for you. We were told Nimitz has got something going on. They've got something in their airspace. Cahill is the fifth Navy witness to come forward. This is the first time he has spoken publicly about the events. We're getting calls up on the bridge to run out on the bridge wing and let us know if you see anything. And they'd give us an angle, and they'd say, do you see anything out there? And a few times, we even turned the ship. And I recall saying, what are we looking for? And I think that they were saying, oh, the Nimitz has got some, some strange contacts. They obviously had something on radar. They wanted us to see if we could put eyes on it. They didn't tell us what we were looking for. We went out on the, um, the bridge wing, and me and one of my lookouts were scanning the sky. What Cahill witnessed has haunted him for 15 years. So we were both looking up ahead, about 45 degrees angle, and there was a constellation of lights up there. Let me get this straight. You're looking up, and you see these pattern of lights. They all changed position, some moving inward towards the center, some moving outward, but all rotating. As it rotated, some of the lights disappeared. 
and then they were gone. I didn't see a trail, I didn't see any effect. It was just, there was a light there, and then there was no longer a light there, but the night was clear. This was not stars being occluded by clouds. That was when I got, I, as I get the goosebumps right now, I got really interested in what was going on. What the hell is this? Cahill is the first eyewitness to describe this abrupt and extraordinary movement of multiple craft. If Princeton had it on the radar, why isn't this on the news every night that something we don't understand is present in our atmosphere, coming and going as it pleases with absolute impunity over our military? Cahill's account bolsters the testimony of his shipmate, Kevin Day. The, the next morning, I went and checked my email, and I had a video from the Black Aces squadron. The following morning at breakfast, I talked to Kevin Day and another chief petty officer who's a radar operator. And I said to them, what was going on last night? And the chief grunted at me, go look at your email. I go in the back and I log on and there's the video. The next morning, Cahill and Day watched a longer version of this video captured by an F-18's camera. It's the same video that wouldn't be seen again until more than a decade later when Elizondo helped get it released to the public in 2017. Every night we would have an operations intelligence briefing. So I kind of smirk and I walk in because I'm like, wow, maybe we're gonna hear something. Maybe we're gonna find out what was going on. Now, as they start the briefing, the young officer in charge gave the little nod to the person running the computer and, you know, next slide. And as they hit the space bar, a, a caricature of a, of a flying saucer with a little green alien moves across the screen. The room erupts in laughter and that was it. The captain said, well, we all, we had a little bit of fun. I guess you guys were chasing something around, but that's over now. Let's get on with the briefing. I'm an intel guy. It's not uncommon that if you have a person in a particular position of trust uh, and you want to keep them quiet, that ridicule can be used as some sort of leverage. Nobody raised an eyebrow, and it didn't seem like anybody cared. We weren't even told not to talk about it. And that was one of the things that, that struck me as being, um, how do I put it, that it delegitimized the experience. And I got to a point where I pretended like it didn't happen. To be honest with you. Someone tells you something you encountered is not real and that you're crazy um, and you got nowhere to go. Finally, after 15 years of carrying this secret around, somebody was paying attention. It was real and other people experienced it too. And he wasn't going crazy. How we doing, brother? Morning. How you doing? You know, any day above ground's a good day. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I've asked Sean to come with us on this trip. He is a trained investigator, knows how to ask the right questions. He also has personal investment in it. I think Sean would like some answers himself. Cahill is joining Elizondo on a mission to Mexico, following a lead from a Navy radar operator. Kevin Day provided us a completely new piece of the puzzle we never had before. Day provided the coordinates where he says a fleet of UFOs disappeared off Navy radar. We can actually now go to the location and we can try to figure out if there's any type of correlation at all. My hope is to hear what people have to say, if anything. If they have anything to provide, I want to be able to hear it uh, myself. Lou Elizondo has asked former Navy law enforcement officer Sean Cahill to join his UFO investigation to Mexico. They're following a lead provided by Cahill's shipmate, Kevin Day. These things were going somewhere. They fell off my radar envelope down off the coast of um, Baja, California. I could tell you the Latin long. The coordinates lead here, a small remote Mexican island called Guadalupe. What I'd really like to see is for us to take the event from 2004 and to show if this phenomenon has continued post-2004. Because this is a part of the Nimitz story that, that not only has never been told, has never really been explored. In order to keep his work for the military's UFO unit secret, Elizondo couldn't interview civilian witnesses. I think there's goodness in casting a wide net, try to get as many people that we can to come on record and tell us what they've seen. My frustration when I was an ATIP was I was always stuck focusing only on military individuals. Well, this is the first time you've been able to, to not hide. 
Right. I hate to put it that way, but you don't have to hide behind anything. You can ask the questions now. Right. The journey to Guadalupe Island starts here. Ensenada, Mexico is a major hub for commercial and tourist fishing. Elizondo and Cahill want to know if locals here have seen strange things in the sky. I'm used to speaking with military people who are experts, but I think in the end it comes down to, to sheer volume and commonalities. If you have people that are both trained observers and untrained observers telling you the same thing, there is a really good possibility that they are both describing a similar event. They've teamed up with Jordi Labrija, a Mexican journalist who says he's heard stories about unexplained sightings in Baja, California for years. So Jordi, who's the gentleman we're gonna be meeting today? He's a, a pilot and he does a lot of flights to Guadalupe and uh, he has seen crazy things as well. Labrija set up a meeting with a commercial pilot who spots bluefin tuna for fishermen between the Baja coast and Guadalupe. That's his plane. It's a 172? Yes. What year? Uh, 83. Wow. It's a beautiful, beautiful bird. Adrian Ojeda has spent 18 years flying over these waters, but it only took a few seconds to change everything he knew about aviation. Thank okay. you again for your time and, and for your courage to come and, forward. And thank you because this is uh, something like uh, I don't tell not so many people because they think you're crazy or you're, you're you know, but so, yeah. Please, just start from the beginning. Yeah, it was January uh, 30, uh, 2015, around three o'clock in the afternoon. This is the first time Ojeda has gone on record about the strange object he saw. So it was coming around 23 miles south of uh, Ensenada. On the afternoon of January 30th, 2015, Ojeda says he was flying over the Pacific, just 20 miles northeast from where two U.S. Navy pilots from the USS Nimitz intercepted a tic-tac-shaped UFO 11 years earlier. Can you give me um, a rough understanding of size, shape, color? I thought the beginning was just a ball, but, uh, when, but when it goes so close, it was like this form. Did you notice if it had any windows? No. If it had wings? No like flight said, surfaces. No windows, no wings, no nothing. Smooth. Smooth and clean, yeah. Ojeda says the object moved erratically, unlike any aircraft he had ever seen. When you see an airplane, it goes straight, you know? But this was kind of like... He also believes the object reacted to his presence. It was so far when I just turned the lights, and as soon as I turned the lights, the, the, she was... Right at you. Straight to me. So it was muy lejos. Uh, around 10 miles, yeah. 10 miles, and then you kick on the lights, and all of a sudden... Three seconds. Three, three seconds. Three, three, four, yeah. Like that. As he turned on his lights, Ojeda says the object flew straight at him at 12,000 miles an hour, or more than 15 times the speed of sound. This pilot really reinforced some of the observables that we've already noticed before. According to Elizondo, his secret Pentagon investigation cataloged a set of five incredible capabilities the UFOs shared. He calls them the observables. Instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocities, uh, just really bizarre behavior, something that you would not expect a traditional aircraft to be able to do. Were there any other reports by any other pilots in the area that day of anything strange in the air that you're aware of? Not that I know. Okay. I'm in international waters. Sometimes I see the carriers and the F-18. You see those kind of airplanes, in no way it was an aircraft. I, I, Ojeda's 2015 account has an eerie similarity to the U.S. Navy's 2004 Tic Tac incident. And all of a sudden it goes, Burp, and it kind of turns. We're like, OK, now it knows we're here. He just rapidly accelerates beyond anything that I've ever seen, crosses my nose, and it's gone. Have the same craft been flying off the Baja coast for years? The Baja California Peninsula is known across Mexico as a hotspot for UFO sightings. For decades, local fishermen have reported strange luminescent objects over the Pacific Ocean. It's our understanding that you may have seen something very interesting in the water. Sí, una luz muy fuerte y nos alusó así y en segundos también desapareció rápido. 
digamos, una especie de esfera. Se miraba así un color este, como plateado, más o menos. Veímos esa luz y de ahí se disparó la... Entonces se fue. 99% of all reported sightings have a rational explanation. Typically, these are things that are man-made or some sort of weather phenomena or atmospheric anomaly. So it's imperative we keep a critical eye on every report. The fishermen may not be trained military observers, but they all have similar accounts of spherical objects flying in ways they can't explain. And one part of their story stands out. Vimos algo que bajó, se paró, y de repente se clavó en el agua. In the water. Yeah. Hey, buenos días. Lou Elizondo and Sean Cahill are in Mexico, investigating one of the most important UFO incidents in the history of the U.S. military, the 2004 USS Nimitz encounter. Very nice to meet you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your time. They're interviewing local fishermen who have seen strange things in the sky and under the water. From our understanding, you may have some interesting information regarding strange things in or near the water. Luces. Luces que están bajo el agua. Luces que salen de, pero del mar. Same thing, lights coming out of the water and moving. Fishermen seeing lights under the water, lights underneath their boat, things coming out of the sky and then floating and hovering above the water and then splashing into the water. I was struck by some of the similarities, in particular with the Nimitz incident. In 2004, the Navy pilot who intercepted a tic-tac-shaped UFO first saw a churning water below the craft. My heart sank. There was something in the water. And a Navy radar technician says his ship tracked the tic-tac-shaped object, moving underwater at a high rate of speed. Went from 30,000 feet down to sea level, and sonar said they got a hit. They pretty much just went wherever they wanted. The ability to seamlessly move through water, air, and space, known as transmedium travel, is one of the five observables Elizondo's secret Pentagon program identified. These objects seem to be seen a lot around large bodies of water. Describe aquí, por favor. These folks, for the most part, are not necessarily trained observers, but they do know the oceans very well. And a lot of them are reporting some pretty interesting and, and in my opinion, pretty compelling things. That's like a tic tac, dude. Let me ask you, where were you when you saw this? Guadalupe. Punta Norte en Isla Guadalupe. La Isla Guadalupe. La Isla de Guadalupe. The fishermen all point toward one location, Guadalupe Island, where senior Navy radar specialist Kevin Day told Elizondo a fleet of UFOs had disappeared off his radar in 2004. Encinadas right here. This is the, the bay right here. OK, we've got Guadalupe down here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 different unique incidents. We've got some amazing data here. Definitely a hot spot. Guadalupe is calling us. Guadalupe lies 150 miles off the Baja California coast. The sparsely populated island is home to a Mexican military weather station and is surrounded by a restricted marine refuge area teeming with great white sharks. The next logical step is to get out there and see for ourselves, is there anything unique? Is there anything underneath the ocean? The topography, is there anything strange and weird? We gotta get out there. I think by going to Guadalupe, we stand to gain um, more clarity. Hopefully we can collect some good information. What matters is what the facts and the data say. That's the pursuit. That's what drives me every single day. We'll probably do about six and a half knots. Yeah. You're looking at 175 nautical miles out to where we need to be. Yeah. It's going to take us a good 25 hours to get out there. When was the last time you were in these waters? You know, I have to do the math on it, but I was in these waters for a number of years. Over the course of 2004, all the way to 2007, on and off. Wow. Yeah, this is where the United States Navy on the West Coast does a great deal of their training. 
We've heard so much about this Guadalupe Island. I hope we get a chance to talk to as many people as we can, talk to other fishermen, talk to anybody who's willing to come out and meet us and have a conversation. I kind of want to consider some of the information that we picked up. We had circular, spherical objects described. I hesitate to say saucer, but a lenticular shape. We had luminous right. objects. Different right. colors right. of luminosity. And we had objects that flew, objects that hovered, and objects that went into the water. And in some cases, objects that came from the deep up to the surface of the water, i.e. rings of light. Unidentified submerged objects, known as USOs, have been reported around the world by civilians and military witnesses for decades. Allied warships taking part in exercise main brace provided a formidable spectacle. In 1952, military personnel taking part in a large-scale NATO exercise off Denmark reported seeing strange round craft flying above and below the water. The incidents made international headlines, and ever since, USOs have become part of UFO lore. We know that there is a geomagnetic anomaly just north of the island, and it is significant. Adding to the mystery surrounding Guadalupe, a variation in the Earth's magnetic field, known as a magnetic anomaly, lies just off the island's northern coast. When you look at the map, there are no magnetic anomalies anywhere within hundreds and hundreds of miles of that island except two hotspots right north of the island. Could that have anything to do with what we're seeing? We don't know. I think we, we owe it to ourselves to collect more data. I think it's in our DNA to, to always search and find the truth, whatever that truth is. Lou was someone who had come into this issue very skeptical and came out of it almost a religious believer that, wow, this stuff is really happening. These are really credible reports from pilots, from other people that are not wacky. He became someone who felt that it was his job to try and get more senior leaders in the Pentagon to pay attention to this, eventually maybe get the public to pay attention. The team is finally approaching Guadalupe, where U.S. Navy and Mexican eyewitnesses say something strange is in the air, or under the water, or both. That's amazing. 30 miles away, you can see that thing. After 20 hours on the open water, Lou Elizondo and Sean Cahill have arrived at Guadalupe Island, where a US Navy radar specialist reported a fleet of strange craft disappeared off his radar scopes during the 2004 USS Nimitz UFO event. This is a, the land that time forgot for sure. Ah, oh, it's just incredible. Guadalupe was formed millions of years ago when two volcanoes erupted on the ocean floor. Today, it's a marine refuge and access is strictly controlled by the Mexican government. As foreigners, the team can't step foot on its shores. <laughs> but they found a group of fishermen who've seen things they can't explain. How fast did it take off? Wow. Now he said it was kind of like a, like a, like a ball, like a yeah. chrome ball. Cuando se empezó a mover, se empezó a mover así, así. These fishermen had never heard of the Nimitz incident, but their accounts are similar to the U.S. Navy witnesses. 
when you come back from fishing and someone sees something like this, do they make fun of the person when they tell the story? No, no se burla, toma consideridad porque... Most of the people have seen strange things happening, so they take it very seriously. The fishermen take them to the island's rocky north coast, where most of the sightings have occurred. It's also where a magnetic anomaly lies deep under the ocean. Oh, see, sí, ahí. Ah, uh, uh -huh. Wow. I've never seen anything like this. Elizondo and Cahill want to know if the strange sightings could have a scientific explanation. Mauricio Hoyos is a world-renowned marine biologist. We know your time is valuable. Thank you very much for spending it with us. Hoyos has been studying great white sharks on Guadalupe for over 15 years and documented what is believed to be the largest great white ever captured on film. We are here because several people have reported very interesting phenomena in the sky and even underwater. And we wanted to get your scientific knowledge of these waters. Well, Guadalupe is a very important place. Actually, it's the best place to see white sharks in the world. The visibility of the water, it's more than 100 feet. Oh, wow. And sometimes you get to see more than 33 sharks in one day. Wow. How come that these white sharks can find this island in the middle of nowhere? And we think that they have these sensors, they are called the Ampilo Florencini, and they can detect the electromagnetic field of the Earth. So we think that they use that in order to get here. Hoyos believes great white sharks have a special ability to detect electromagnetic signals, which helps them migrate to the island each year. I was talking with one of the captains, and he told me that every time that they are coming to Guadalupe, he can see that the compass is like moving awkward. That's interesting. Is there bioluminescence in these waters? They're yeah, actually bio. very close to the shore. Bioluminescence is a natural phenomenon found in oceans all over the world. It occurs when a chemical reaction in sea life emits light. Could this explain the luminescent objects in the water the fishermen of Guadalupe are seeing? OK, so do you ever see bioluminescence in circular patterns, almost like a spotlight coming out of the water? No. You have a small submersible, right? So there's lights on it, I'm sure, for navigation. Yes. Could fishermen around the island mistake your submersible for a light under the water? We have had submersibles just in 2008, and I need a special permit for that. If the submersible is here, the big boat has to be here. Ah, OK, so you have a boat nearby, exactly. so it's not isolated out in no. the middle of the ocean. Exactly. According to Hoyos, there is nothing he knows that can explain what the fishermen of Guadalupe are seeing. You are a scientist and trained observer. In our book, that's as good as it gets. So hearing from you, anything that you'd be willing to share with us would be immensely important. Is there anything you have seen that has been unusual? Yeah, and I thought that it was a, a hallucination, but my captain and I, we saw the same thing. We have lots of reports from fishermen around the island. Is there anything that you have seen that has been unusual? Yeah, and I thought that it was a, a hallucination, but my captain and I, we saw the same thing. Lou Elizondo and Sean Cahill are more than 100 miles off the coast of Mexico, where a fleet of UFOs fell off US Navy radar during the USS Nimitz incident in 2004. In 2006, we started to track white sharks for 24 hours. Marine biologist Mauricio Hoyos has spent years collecting data on great white sharks, but he can't explain what he saw early one morning in 2006. It was like 6 a.m. and we were coming to the north, and then I saw in that mountain, I saw a little light, like a little sphere. I thought that it was a star, but suddenly it, it moved. I thought, oh my God. I didn't sleep, and maybe I am looking something that is not real. And then my captain asked me, did you see that? Could you actually see an object, or was it more the light that you could see? No, it was a very bright object. It was like a sphere. I mean, a perfect sphere. Like maybe in two seconds. Two seconds. Two seconds, we didn't see anything. 
So it didn't just disappear. It no, it moved. Okay. It moved. So yeah, very, definite very sense of movement. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it very, very fast. Yeah. yeah. I know time is limited. Sun's going to be going down. Don't want to take much more of your time. Been super, super helpful. Doctor, thank, thank you sir. so much. You're very welcome. It has You're been an absolute thank pleasure. Thank you. That's amazing. As far back as 2009, the Pacific Ocean off Baja, California, was identified by Elizondo's Pentagon program as part of a global pattern of UFO hotspots. After days on the open water, interviewing multiple civilian witnesses, Elizondo now has evidence of a continuing UFO presence in the area. The trip to Guadalupe Island was very well worthwhile. The eyewitness testimony from folks from the Nimitz. He just rapidly accelerates beyond anything that I've ever seen and it's gone. Was corroborated by civilians. So between Guadalupe Island and Ensenada seems to be a real hotspot. When you look at the data, the Nimitz was not an isolated event. In fact, the Nimitz may have just happened to trip over one of these hotspots when they were doing their maneuvers out there. It's, it's one of the pieces to the puzzle. But we would be remiss if we consider it the whole puzzle. It's not. The mission to Guadalupe Island provided valuable new information. But for Elizondo and Cahill, the journey was also personal. Being part of that incident on the USS Nimitz and now being here 14 years later, right, some time, uh, talk about a cold case. What's it like? I got to be honest with you, man. I dig it why people don't come forward, because it's isolating. There were 5,000 people on Nimitz. How many people saw it and aren't willing to come forward? I know what I saw. Even if I don't know what it is, I know I saw it. I, it was on tape. It was on radar. I mean, that, that boosts me. We don't have all the answers yet. But we know it's real. This had affected Sean profoundly. He didn't talk about it much because, quite frankly, he thought people were going to look at him like he was crazy. Do you know what it's like to serve your country, to swear an oath of loyalty, only to have someone come out and say, you're crazy? You know, f you. I've spent my life living in the shadows. I've put myself out there voluntarily. So I've got no one to blame but me. I have people who question my credibility at every turn. I want so badly to show people what I've seen and what I know. But I can't, because I have a non-disclosure agreement with the US government. It's very frustrating for me, because I know this is real. When you look at some of the other incidents over time that we've collected back in ATIP, we continue to see the same pattern over and over and over again. Elizondo was back in the States, briefing the team on his trip to Mexico. More people are bringing information in cases to us, military and civilian people. And I think this kind of data and information is beginning to make a difference as we're bringing it forward. As former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Chris Mellon knows how difficult it is for military personnel to come forward with stories of UFO encounters. Those people in the military at these lower level operational ranks are also swimming upstream, trying to get people's attention and say, hey, we got a genuine issue here, people. We need to take action. And I'm delighted that we're able to assist them in doing that. But it's not only the military personnel involved in the incidents who have been silenced. I would much rather put this behind me, but the problem is, I've seen too much. I've talked to too many people. I have too many reports. I, I, I know it's real. I, ca I can't in good conscience just keep my head buried in the sand. I had to leave the very job that I love to get my point across. The trip to Mexico was a bit of a revelation for us. Certainly when I was an ATIP, there was no way I would have been able to go into a foreign country and start asking questions about this thing. There's no way that would have happened. Lou Elizondo has new evidence that he believes confirms an ominous pattern. The Pacific Ocean off Southern California and Mexico is a hot spot for unidentified craft with incredible capabilities. If it's okay with you, I'm gonna go ahead and provide you his information. The newfound freedom to bring information directly to the public is a victory for Elizondo. 
ATIP had a small group of allies, but equally there was a small group of people who were diametrically opposed and became increasingly vocal about their opposition to what we were doing. Elizondo spent 10 years studying reports of military encounters with UFOs. But according to Elizondo, getting anyone inside the Pentagon to pay attention to what he was finding was a daily struggle. Sound is beating. This intelligence officer worked closely with Elizondo at the Pentagon and saw firsthand the challenges he faced. When I found out Lou was resigning, I was personally very upset. This is my friend, my coworker, a mentor, somebody that I truly believed in. Because she continues to work for the Department of Defense, she wants to remain anonymous. Lou sees things in patterns and he sees the analytic piece behind putting all of this puzzle together and what the various outcomes could be. Unfortunately, he had to work through layers of bureaucracy that he would only read about in 1960s Russia. It doesn't matter what administration it is, it doesn't matter who's in charge, it's just, oh, this is gonna get very messy very quickly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it along. The government, I believe, doesn't know what to do. They don't know how to address this. Help us understand how is it that the people who are entrusted with some of the most dangerous missions, when they write a report that that is not taken seriously. If you're pursuing this and very vocal and very public about it, you won't have a career. And that's been stated, it's been proven. There is no question that it's dangerous. Are you scared yourself about your own career and your own proximity to this issue? Question. Fear of being called crazy wasn't the only roadblock to getting Pentagon leadership to care about the issue. Some officials that I talked to told me that they thought there was resistance in the Pentagon on religious grounds, that effectively you had some senior officers who were Christians who thought looking into this kind of voodoo stuff was dangerous. I was pulled into the office of one of these seniors. The senior looked at me in the eye and said, I want this program to stop. He said, well, OK, but what's the rationale? And he said, well, um, what you are looking at is something that is a demonic presence. There's a faction in the government high up in the Pentagon of religious fundamentalists who are concerned that anything paranormal or supernatural is demonic in origin, that flying saucers represent demons, that if you study this, that you're inviting the devil and Satan into your world. You're telling me to ignore it because it goes against your philosophical belief system. Well, that's the same that I faced in Afghanistan and in the Middle East. There's no difference. Only you're wearing a three-piece suit and they're carrying a Kalashnikov. So I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Elizondo says his superior's religious beliefs hindered his mission to get the government to take UFOs seriously. But he and other government insiders, including former presidential advisor John Podesta, believe the larger political culture is to blame. There's a natural tendency to just kind of sweep the question away and to avoid the taboo. We've created a culture where you really can't do what any Scientists would want to do any skeptic in the best sense of the word saying, well, maybe we ought to know about it. So imagine this for a moment. Your job is to give the boss recommended solutions. Imagine going now to the boss. Sir, we have something. We don't know what it is. We don't know how it works. We don't know who's behind the wheel. We don't know what their intentions are. And by the way, there's not a damn thing we can do about it. By 2017, Elizondo had become so concerned that whatever these craft were, the U.S. military had no way to defend itself against their advanced technology. So he tried to send a warning up the chain of command. I realized that none of the information and developments that we had in our program in ATIP was being communicated to the Secretary of Defense. Elizondo believed the threat was so great that it required the attention of then Secretary of Defense James Mattis. There are five people I can count on this hand that if they were to call me at four o'clock in the morning, I would put my boots on and I'd go to war with them. 
Secretary Mattis is number one. He is truly one of the greatest Americans I've ever had the honor and pleasure to serve with and for. Despite being one of the military's most experienced counterintelligence operatives, even fighting alongside Mattis in Afghanistan in the months after 9-11, every attempt to get a meeting with the Secretary of Defense was thwarted. In this particular case, you had a lot of people that were worried about their political careers. I attended some meetings that, that Lou was present at, trying to see how I could be helpful. And this actually led to meetings with these senior people who were very close to General Mattis. And they were very sympathetic, but they did not see a way ahead. They did not see how they could get this by the Praetorian Guard around the secretary. This is a man who's responsible for, for the safety and security of our country. And if you don't give him the information he needs, that is ammunition in order for him to make a right decision. Despite our best efforts, we were not successful in actually getting this issue in front of the secretary and letting him evaluate uh, the evidence himself. We've got a problem internally. We've got blinders on, and if we've got blinders on, baby, you're gonna get blindsided. On the next Unidentified. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the AFA. You know those voices? We're just trying to figure out what were the objects that we saw. I've always kind of been somewhat skeptical. I I'm a lot more convinced now these vehicles do exist. It was basically a cube with inside of sphere. Over 60 people have seen these things. If people in the DC area knew within minutes of their location, these unidentified vehicles are operating, I think they would say, isn't this something we ought to pay attention to?